In actually enrolling members into CHSAs, leaders need to be selective. Because CHSAs are private entities, membership in them must be voluntary. Entry need not be open to just anyone and everyone, however. To the contrary, a CHSA should be quite circumspect in its acceptance of members, aiming for quality before quantity, and collecting assets instead of liabilities. Initially, the core leaders should enroll individuals personally known to them as qualified and reliable. Then a system of collective sponsorship, inquiry, deliberation, and selection should be employed. Each prospective member should be approved or rejected by vote of the existing members, based on their assessment of the candidate's credentials. The intent being that membership will be deserved, earned, or otherwise warranted, not simply conferred willy-nilly on just anyone who applies. The more difficult membership in a CHSA is to obtain, the more desirable it will be. And the more people know that selection demands demonstrated qualifications, the fewer unfit individuals will seek entry. To work effectively and fairly, though, this process must be based on high, objective standards. Qualifications should not be defined excessively, let alone exclusively, in terms of an aspirant's accomplishments and affiliations within the community. For the militia of the several states must depend upon ordinary, even more than outstanding, Americans, and the former widely outnumber the latter. Rather, the focus should be on an individual's attitudes, knowledge, and skills necessary or desirable in each member for the CHSA's effective operations. Of the three, attitudes are most important, because without the proper attitudes, individuals will not require the knowledge, and even with the knowledge will not develop and maintain the skills requisite for active, effective membership. Specifically, to the greatest extent possible, members of a particular CHSA should be recruited from within the same local community for at least three reasons. First, so that everyone in a CHSA will know, or can easily come to know, everyone else personally, not only within the CHSA itself, but also in everyday life. This, to instill in every member mutual familiarity, trust, and reliance, a strong sense of individual responsibility to the group, and an ethos that disdains letting down the group or any of its members. Second, so that upon passage of the necessary state legislation, many of the CHSA's members will volunteer for, and be able immediately to function in, a regular militia company or other unit established in that locality. Third, to minimize infiltration, manipulation, and takeovers of the CHSA by agents provocateurs and other troublemakers. Rogue public agencies or private groups intent on destroying the movement to revitalize the militia of the several states may have at their disposal a superabundance of potential infiltrators in gross, but not in each and every particular neighborhood or other locality. Therefore, their schemes will perforce have to rely on foreign faces. The likelihood that large numbers of CHSAs organized on a strictly local basis with no or few outside members, can be destabilized by such tactics, will be remote. At the minimum, where state and local laws permit, each and every applicant for membership in a CHSA who is not a conscientious objector should already possess, or should be encouraged to obtain on his own in timely fashion, a good working knowledge of and skills with various types of firearms, ammunition, and related accoutrements at least equivalent to what is taught in the National Rifle Association's basic rifle, pistol, and shotgun courses. These qualifications could be established by the applicant's status or training as a certified firearms instructor, gunsmith, or armorer. His CCP, where a proven proficiency with a firearm was prerequisite, his certificates of completion of suitable NRA or other standard courses, or in some other appropriate manner. This is not intended to make membership in a CHSA contingent on some sort of paramilitary training, but only to encourage every member who advocates the revitalization of the militia of the several states to the general public 
himself to satisfy, if legally possible, the fundamental principle that everyone in the militia other than conscientious objectors should possess and know how to use his own firearm. No contradiction exists, though, between membership in a CHSA or in the militia and an individual's conscientious objection to the personal possession and use of firearms. For many types of militia service could be studied in a CHSA and actually, con and actually performed in revitalized militia companies without any involvement of firearms at all. In addition, applicants for membership should be ranked and chosen on the basis of further knowledge and skills particularly suitable for Homeland Security, including former military and police service, training in self-defense and martial arts, survival or other outdoor skills, service or training in firefighting, rescue, or emergency response units, medical, dental, or paramedical practice, and familiarity with such fields as gunsmithing, engineering, construction, communications and information technology, machining, and automotive maintenance. Knowledge and skills of these types will be absolutely necessary if a CHSA is to devise and test a workable program for revitalization of the militia. Where possible, too, a CHSA should recruit individuals whose personal resources, as well as their achievements, prominence, and credibility in the community can advance the cause. In this regard, an applicant's disposable wealth, social and political position, business acumen and success, and other marks of distinction should be considered. Of course, a CHSA should never turn away an applicant solely because of their lack of these accomplishments. In the final analysis, the resources most in need are good heads and stout hearts, not financial success and social eclat. If a CHSA finds itself with an overabundance of members of a certain talents, skills, or resources, and a dearth of members with others, it should suggest an exchange of members with neighboring CHSAs that have complementary imbalances, so as to equalize as much as possible the distribution of assets among them all. Finally, with respect to some problems of homeland security, no CHSA of reasonable size could obtain members possessed of all the necessary talents, knowledge, skills, accomplishments, and resources. But a cluster of neighboring CHSAs likely could. Therefore, in such cases, the goal should be for all the necessary attributes to be represented in each cluster. When enrolling recruits into a CHSA, its leaders and members ought to be skeptical. A list of disqualifications should be drawn up, and its prescriptions rigorously enforced. Individuals prohibited from membership should include at least all aliens illegally in the United States, known or suspected criminals or other individuals with demonstrated proclivities towards illegal or antisocial behavior, other individuals whose personal possession of firearms, ammunition, or related accoutrements may be prohibited by national, state, or local law, and especially known or suspected agitators, agents provocateurs, subversives, or other troublemakers intent on embroiling the CHSA and its members in illegal or otherwise questionable activities. Besides always being wary of these and other dangerous infiltrators, every CHSA should also be careful to winnow out the proverbial summer soldiers and sunshine patriots, who will amount only to hangers-on and dead wood, taking up places more worthy individuals could occupy. No less undesirable are persons motivated by petty careerism. Every CHSA, after all, should be intended to disappear as soon as possible upon revitalization of its state's militia, leaving nothing for those who desire to play the parts of organizational bigwigs. After it is fully formed and functional, a CHSA should second or loan a few of its most well-rounded members to neighboring localities in order to assist in the formation of new CHSAs there. Thus, the movement will expand across the state in the manner of drops of oil spreading across water. 4. Basis of Organization 
If citizens' homeland security associations were to follow the pattern typically set for militia companies in the pre-constitutional colonies and states, they would organize themselves on essentially geographical and political bases, say by counties, towns, and sections of or neighborhoods in cities and suburbs. That approach worked well in the 1600s and 1700s because citizens' homes, places of employment, markets, and houses of worship were usually cited in relatively close proximity to one another, and the tasks of homeland security in that era were essentially the same for every locale in which members of the militia lived and worked. Today, conversely, many people often reside at a far removal in both distance and time from their workplaces, shopping centers, and recreational facilities, and depend upon private and public transportation by rail, road, or other means to travel from one location to another. Also, the problems of homeland security are decidedly different for 1. residential areas, 2. places of business open to the general public, such as high-rise office buildings, shopping centers, local and state governmental complexes, schools, and hospitals. 3. museums, cinema complexes, parks, and sports stadia. And 4. transportation networks. For that reason, the organization of a militia company suitable for providing homeland security in, say, a residential area, might not, indeed probably would not, work for a large office building, and the organization of a militia company suitable for either a residential area or an office building would almost surely not be adequate for a major railroad station. In addition, not beyond the realm of possibility and practicality, and perhaps even necessity, is that certain individuals might find themselves members of more than one militia company depending on their locations at different times. Thus, an individual who resided in a particular neighborhood might, in an emergency, report to a militia company based in that neighborhood when he was at home. When commuting to work, though, he might report to a militia company designated to provide homeland security to the commuter rail system he used. And when at work, he might serve in a militia company assigned to protect the office building, business complex, or industrial park in which he was employed. In any event, CHSAs must take considerations of this type into account when structuring themselves. How they investigate and solve such problems will depend on the imaginations and ingenuity of their members on the spot. 5. Optimal Size In principle, at one extreme, a citizen's homeland security association might consist of no more than a single individual, who would better be described as a citizen's homeland security advocate. Semantics aside, to be effective, such a lone activist would need to be extremely knowledgeable about the subject, experienced in the theory and practice of interpersonal and public relations, political organizing, and especially legislative lobbying, possessed of visibility, credibility, and influential connections in the community, and above all, endowed with sufficient disposable funds and free time to prosecute the project continuously to its successful completion. So the likelihood of even one such person appearing in each state is minuscule. At the other extreme, in principle a CHSA could contain many hundreds of individuals. Although this is more likely, it is even less desirable than an imaginary single activist for several reasons. First, a very large CHSA would be organizationally impractical. The larger its size, the more unwieldy its operation. Moreover, as is typical in large groups, relatively few members would end up performing most of the CHSA's necessary work, while shirkers would disappear in the anonymity of the crowd of hangers-on who managed, on one excuse or another, to participate in the CHSA's activities infrequently, if at all. Second, an overly large CHSA would complicate planning. If it contained members from several geographical areas, it would need to split up its membership into various regional committees to deal effectively with the problems of homeland security in each of those areas. A cumbersome and tedious task that could be avoided in the first instance simply by forming several CHSAs on a regional basis. Third, 
for the same reason an excessively large CHSA would be politically counterproductive. If its members lived in several legislative districts, to maximize its effectiveness, the CHSA would need to divide itself into that many separate committees, which could have been accomplished more easily in the first place through the formation of several CHSAs. A proliferation of CHSAs does not entail inefficiency, because the purpose of each of them is to model a militia company or other unit of the state's revitalized militia within its own area. And the most realistic model is always the one made to exact full scale. So ideally, a CHSA should contain the number of individuals that would constitute such a militia unit. This is not because a CHSA is intended to function as a private militia or other paramilitary organization, but instead because each CHSA should be designed and operated as an advisory committee for its state's legislature in order to evaluate and test, under the most realistic local conditions, competing theories as to what size particular militia units should be in particular locales, so as to be able to draft, in cooperation with other CHSAs, the proper statute on the basis of these experimental results, and, in the course of that work, to encourage commitment from significant numbers of individuals to volunteer for these militia units when the necessary statute has been enacted. As the foregoing suggests, only careful thought and diligent experimentation can determine what the best form, size, and composition of any particular militia unit in particular locality should be. So each CHSA must test various approaches by trial and error. And the more varied, original input into the problem and competition in ideas as reflected in a multiplicity of CHSAs, the better. Self-evidently, too, in a fully revitalized system, militia companies should always be relatively small in terms of their individual memberships, and therefore very numerous, the result being that they will be so highly dispersed throughout each state as essentially to saturate her territory. This is absolutely necessary because in the event of the worst possible case, that being either domestic usurpation and tyranny, or foreign invasion, all of which would likely compel the militia to operate according to the strategy and tactics of irregulars or guerrillas. The militia could draw resistors, activists, and supplies from small, secure, secret bases scattered essentially everywhere, which the oppressors would have difficulty discovering, let alone destroying in their entirety or even in significant number. In practice, the most manageable size for any particular CHSA must be a matter of its own research and experimentation, for it will depend upon, and therefore must be tailored to, the actual locale in which the CHSA will operate, in terms of the type of community, the size of its population, the nature and extent of its territory, the tasks relating to homeland security to be undertaken there, the number of qualified individuals who can be recruited within the area, the propiniquity of other CHSAs, and so on. In a cluster of CHSAs, though, it might prove useful to have one or more of them structured as specialist units, for which their peculiar tasks or equipment would determine their sizes. 6. Physical Facilities and Logistics a CHSA or its individual members should have access to, but would not necessarily need ownership of, whatever physical facilities were necessary for meetings, study, experimentation with different models for militia organization and training, and other program activities. At first, a CHSA's meetings could be held in the members' private homes. Then, as the organization expands in size, in a rented hall, or a loaned-out church, or so on and so forth. Studies could generally be conducted in private dwellings, with the CHSA's membership divided into subgroups of convenient size, and the organization providing a lending library the contents of which would circulate among various members' homes. Knowledge and instruction in the safe use of firearms are absolutely essential for all Americans as a consequence of our constitutional duty to serve in the militia, 
and therefore to prepare ourselves for that service. But instruction will require specialized facilities not economically feasible for every CHSA to supply. So, where state and local laws allow, a CHSA should encourage each member to 1. Provide themselves with one or more suitable firearms. 2. Obtain access to a firearms range, gun club, or equivalent facility. And 3. Engage in regular training of specified kinds on their own. In some areas, the absence of suitable facilities for the use of firearms could be overcome by having familiarization and practice performed with air rifles and pistols, which could be done, local ordinance and safety considerations permitting, in the backyard, garage, or cellar of almost any private home. With respect to other educational needs, a CHSA should take advantage of facilities available to private citizens in the area, such as Red Cross courses in first aid and CPR, schools teaching paramedical and emergency response skills, schools of martial arts, groups that provide instruction in survival and other outdoor techniques, and so on. And where instruction relating specifically to homeland security is offered only to members of governmental agencies, at their facilities, each CHSA that can should recruit personnel from those agencies to conduct informal instruction for its own members, and should encourage public officials to open such facilities to suitably qualified members of every CHSA and of the general public. 7. Finances Inasmuch as a CHSA cannot long function without funds, their source must be a major concern from the beginning. After the core leaders have supplied the monies necessary to start the process, the members themselves must defray both their own and the organization's expenses, just as militia units were required to do under the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts, and should be required to do under any modern state statute. Thus, a good test of the commitment of any member of a CHSA will be his willingness, within the limits of his resources, to bear the economic burden of membership. Each CHSA should collect sufficient funds to meet normal operating expenses through regular membership dues and assessments. Also, inasmuch as they are modeling militia companies, CHSAs might employ the method of self-finance commonly mandated in pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts, namely the imposition of fines for members' failures to satisfy organizational requirements. For example, if without detriment to itself a CHSA could lawfully require that each of its members, other than conscientious objectors, should equip themselves with a suitable rifle, ammunition, and necessary accoutrements, and when so furnished should pass appropriate safety and firing range qualification tests, it might also stipulate that failure to do so within a certain period would result in assessment of fines to be paid into the CHSA's general fund, and, absent payment, dismissal of the defaulter from the CHSA. Of course, if under state or local law such a membership requirement might arguably transform the CHSA into some sort of military organization, it could not be used. In any event, in the spirit of fraternal cooperation necessary for the success of a CHSA, and ultimately of the militia, these sources of income should be supplemented as occasion requires with outright grants from wealthier members and patrons to alleviate the burden on those economically less well-off. Organizations or groups outside of the movement to revitalize the militia might be solicited for assistance with funding of CHSAs, particularly for extraordinary expenses. Such subsidies must be carefully scrutinized, however, because an apparent gift of money could also serve a donor's ulterior motive to control, co-opt, subvert, or taint the CHSA receiving it. And in all instances, each CHSA must deal appropriately with all funds collected from any source. In terms of accounting for income and expenditures, compliance with any applicable tax codes, and so on. Eight, organizational self-defense. When dealing with leadership, membership, 
and funding of a CHSA, and in all of its operations, emphasis should be placed on protecting the organization and its members. Undoubtedly, opponents of revitalizing the militia of the several states will attempt to discredit, distract, and deflect from their true mission, debilitate, destabilize, and if possible destroy CHSAs in every practical way. These attacks must be foreseen, forestalled, and frustrated. Externally, opponents' assaults will range from derision, captious criticisms that the militia are operationally outdated and useless, through defamation, charges that CHSAs are camouflaged private militia or paramilitary organizations of some dangerously extremist caste, to outright delegitimatization, campaigns of extralegal or illegal harassment. Every one of these tactics can be thwarted, however, provided that CHSAs adhere strictly to, and always rely on, constitutional principles in all of their operations. This will prove to be every CHSA's greatest strength. For in contrast to self-styled private militia, CHSAs will be able to assert not simply their members' individual rights to keep and bear arms, but also their members' collective rights to associate, speak out in public, and petition public officials, all for the ultimate purpose of promoting legislation aimed at restoring the militia of the several states to their rightful governmental status and functions as the best, if not the only, means to deal with the contemporary challenges of homeland security. Internally, opponents will surely launch attacks that could prove far more dangerous because they will aim precisely at diverting CHSAs from the constitutional principles that form their most effective defense, thereby fully exposing them to external threats. One predictable tactic will be infiltration, not simply by informers and moles, who will use their positions to spy on and then betray confidences, but also by agents of influence, individuals who will attempt to weaken a CHSA by disrupting its internal activities with artificial power struggles, debates, disputes, and diversions into issues unrelated to revitalization of the militia. Politicization in favor of a particular party or candidates for elective office, personality conflicts, bureaucratic wheel spinning, or dissipation of funds. And worse yet, by agents provocateurs, individuals who will promote actions designed to blacken a CHSA's reputation with the general public and to set up its members for assaults by rogue law enforcement agencies. Another expectable tactic will be infusions of money with strings attached the donors intending to divert the CHSA from its proper mission, to infest it with agents of influence or agents provocateurs, or to blacken its reputation and destroy its credibility by suddenly exposing some notorious group or individual as the original source or conduit of the funds. To deal with these difficulties, in addition to restricting membership to individuals who actually live in the locality, each CHSA or cluster of CHSAs should appoint a counterintelligence committee to perform the necessary investigations and oversight of leaders, members, outside contributors, and related matters, bringing any adverse findings to the membership for action as soon as possible. 9. Legal form. Another important consideration is what legal form a CHSA should take. For example, a private unincorporated association, a nonprofit corporation, a tax-exempt entity, and so on. On the one hand, because revitalization of the militia will take considerable time, anywhere from one to five years, if Providence smiles on the endeavor, CHSAs may have a considerable life expectancy. On the other hand, upon statutory revitalization of the militia in a particular state, CHSAs there would no longer serve any purpose and many of their members would volunteer for and be observed into regular militia companies, or other units. Thus, having performed their function, the CHSAs would be transformed by attrition into mere shells, dissolution being their eventual fate when they succeed in their mission, and the sooner the better for that, organizing CHSAs in any complex form, such as tax-exempt nonprofit corporations, would simply consume time and resources, and tie up members in needless formalities, 
to no particular long-term purpose. This is especially true in consideration of the large number of CHSAs that might be created and then dissolved in any state in which the movement for revitalization of the militia took hold. All in all, the best legal form for a CHSA would probably be that of simply a private, unincorporated association. Such an entity could avoid most, if not all, onerous governmental regulation, oversight, reporting requirements, and other burdens imposed on corporations. And unlike a typical corporation, a CHSA structured as a private unincorporated association could not be successfully subverted by agents of influence or agents provocateurs, who managed to finagle themselves into leadership positions. If an internal coup succeeded in taking over a CHSA in the corporate form, the plotters would gain control of the entity, its corporate name and charter, its bank account, any physical facilities it owned or leased, and any special legal privileges it enjoyed, such as tax-exempt status. The loyal members would then have to either comply with the plotters' dictates, or to lose the right to participate in the CHSA's activities and use its facilities, and in the latter case, would then have to bear the costs and cut through the legal red tape necessary to form a new corporation to carry on their own work. Conversely, if some cabal seized control of a CHSA organized as a private unincorporated association, which owned no physical facilities and operated with funds contributed by members on an ad hoc basis only as debts came due, the loyal members could simply take their persons, their money, and their willingness to work for the revitalization of the militia with them and reorganize themselves elsewhere, leaving the plotters with essentially nothing. In any particular case, the choice of an organizational form for CHSA should be made only with the advice of legal counsel, particularly as to proper accounting for funds raised and expenses paid, tax questions, state and local zoning and other codes that might impact meetings and other group activities, insurance, especially where firearms instruction and practice are involved, reporting requirements and other restrictions on lobbying state legislators, and so on. For example, in some states, although local CHSAs could remain unincorporated associations, it might prove beneficial, even if not absolutely necessary, to create a single tax-exempt corporation for the purpose of conducting all the lobbying efforts that state law subjects to registration and reporting. Members of CHSAs need to avoid being tripped up on these matters so that they do not end up fighting unproductive battles with ignorant and hostile bureaucrats and judges over legal technicalities, rather than succeeding in revitalizing the militia. End of part 12.